don't want to listen to me. Over to you, John. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, what I've got running here, and I'm going to turn it off in a minute, but now we've got it working, I thought I'd put this in at the beginning of the talk in case it didn't work later on when I want it to. Um, this is the actual logging program that we use to actually drive by. I have this on a roof of a car, as you'll see later. And what this is doing is the computer is controlling to each of the different frequencies, taking a calibrated reading in dB microvolts per meter and storing it into a file. So it does this um, five readings a second. And this is actually set up automatically scanning the band edges of all of the VDSL. So now you've seen that and you've got some idea of uh, how it's, what it looks like. I'll just stop it, close it down. Don't know what that is, and hopefully start my presentation. Hey, everything's working. Um, so what I'm going to do is a lot of my presentation is about the VDSL survey and the VDSL drive-by monitoring that we've been doing. I'll also tell you a little bit about some of the other work of the EMC committee, which is to do with the website updates and to do with standards, the IARU committee, and tell you a little bit about how we're going to focus ourselves towards the 2022 strategy. We're just on one screen, are we? Yeah. Okay. So, what is VDSL2? It's also called superfast broadband or fiber to the cabinet. Basically, start off and you have here the exchange, a fiber optic cable to the cabinet, which is usually within a kilometer of your house, and then existing copper wire to the house. The way that VDSL works is it sends information up and down this communication in alternating bands. U bands are upstream and D bands are downstream. What is actually used depends on how far the, you are from the cabinet. How long and how grotty that bit of plain old telephone system copper wire is depends the service you get. If you happen to be lucky enough from a super fast broadband perspective to live right opposite the cabinet but don't speak to Graham Coomber about this because he's just had one put in opposite him but he will get absolutely super fast broadband and proportional to the speed of the broadband will be the level of interference that you get on your radios so 10% of the lucky people can get all of these bands can get 80 meg plus broadband and probably 30 dB of noise if you live a bit further away, then you will not be able to use D3 because the attenuation and the noise will be so bad that it can't get any data through, so it'll only step down and use the other bands. If, like me, you happen to be even further away, then you will only be able to use upstream zero and downstream one. Unfortunately, as a parameter, what we see is not only what's going up and down our line, but what's going up and down all our neighbours' lines as well. Because this, although its technical term is quadrature amplitude modulation, it actually uses tones at various phases and various amplitudes to code bits of data on it, what it actually sounds like is white noise. So white noise integrates across the bandwidth. So you actually see the sum of the noise from all of your neighbours' lines and if the line balance, in other words how grotty that bit of wire is, is bad, then you will have more noise. One other thing I'll just mention now um, is that it's not only the grottiness of that bit of wire which acts as an aerial if it's above ground, but also inside your house here you've probably got lots and lots of extension wiring wonder what sort of lengths they are. Probably between 5 and 30 metres. If you were trying to build an antenna, 
How long a bit of wire would you use? <laughs> so you've got, effectively, your radio system is acting as a receiver for whatever is radiated from the overhead drop wire and what's radiated from the extension wires in your house and your neighbours and the guy across the road and the guy down the street and if you're unlucky, on the next DP as well. DP is distribution point. So that's what VDSL is. Thanks to someone who's here in the audience, we have a rather excellent example of what it looks like. Sorry about the poor resolution. And I'm sorry about walking in front of the screen, but I don't think I can control the mouse. So down, see that pit, that dip and that dip. Then that side of the first dip is downstream too. The dip is the transition frequency. This bit up here is upstream two. The dip is the transition frequency, and this is downstream three. Thank you, Jim. It's one of the best examples I've got. So what's this funny shape on here? Any ideas? It's the gain of his antenna. Because we're measuring in dBm, I think in this, the gain of his antenna affects it. So one of the problems we have if we want to do some measurements, is it up on that screen as well? Oh, yeah. great. Sorry, I can only point at one. But uh, um, if we want to do some measurements, then we actually have to try and find a way of getting rid of these variances due to the S meter, due to the receiver, and due to the antenna you'll use. So what we actually asked people to do in the survey was to measure there, there, and there, which is at, before the band transition in the um, guard band and the other side of the band transmission. By taking those ratios, I now have a measurement which is completely independent of your test setup. And it's a measure of the change in step across the band transitions. John, um, I've noticed at my location there are actually transmitters inside the guard band. There are. And they're actual real, they do use some. They use them um, in certain guard bands, but also you'll find there's real signals inside the guard band. Agreed. For them to try to find it. We did ask to, to try and move it a little bit to try and not have a signal, but it is sometimes difficult. But because we're looking for three ratios, either a step down there, a step down or up there, and a transition between there and there, what we found in... Three data transmissions in the 12 megahertz slot. Yeah, you will do. It is, and when we see that in the results, but we just we needed to try and find something that was evidence of a problem. And if there's evidence at any band transition, then there's evidence of a problem. Unfortunately, at some of the other band transitions, 12 is the worst, and you'll see in a bit, I have troubles with 12 as well. So we did the survey. And what we were looking for was the VDSL signature, which I've just described to you, the up and the down and something you could measure on the S meter. We only use the difference in the levels at nearby frequencies, which eliminates the variance. And you can make better measurements if you've got a spectrum analyzer, much more useful ones. But we can still get some idea off what we've done. So, thank you very much, guys. How many responses did we get? Any ideas? Run a sweepstake? 200, any, any advance on 200? 500, any advance on 500? Sorry? That's about right. In fact, we got so many that we broke SurveyMonkey for the RSGB. We exceeded their limit. It was the first time it's ever been done, so they had to go up to the next level. How many of you responded? Great. Fantastic. How many of you who responded thought you had VDSL RFI after you'd looked? Okay, so a number of people found it. How many of the people in the room who didn't respond are going to go and have a look and see if they really have it? Thank you. For you guys, we've left the survey open because although we now have over a thousand 
full sets of data, we've got lots of partial sets of data, we've got over a thousand full sets of data that I'm going to report into, the more the merrier, the more evidence we can get. So I think that was successful. I'm now going to attempt to explain what these graphs mean. So if I can get onto there, you should be able to see it on both screens. So the blue graph is the percentage of people that had something who had overhead feeds. And the red line is the percentage that had underground feeds. And what we're looking for here is the step size. So people who had a step size of less than 6 dB with overhead feeds was about 68%. So 68% of the people at this particular band transition, we didn't see a problem. What does that mean? It means that 32% did have a problem. All right? Sorry I'm sitting down, but it's the only way I can run the mouse. And then what we've done is we've done the same graph for the um, up to 6 dB step, up to 12 dB step, up to 18 dB step, up to 24 dB step, up to 30 dB step, getting a bit worried, up to 36 dB step, up to 42 dB step, and even more. Okay? So, there's no impact from VDSL from the first column. We've said less than 6 dB is no impact. I mean, you might disagree, but somewhere to start. There is an impact if you have more than 6 dB. And the bigger, the big impact. One thing that we're a bit puzzled about with this... How can you say there was no impact to, to, on the first uh, indication of those two bars there? I don't understand that. Because it's less than a 6 dB step in, across the transition, in fact, 90% of them are 0 dB steps across the transition, I'm saying that at that transition, I can't see any impact of VDSL. You can't see it because it's masked by other stuff that's in the guard band, because the person's not reporting the, what he sees. That could be part of the reason. But I, think, I think the data is not quite right in that context. It's the best I've got. Yes, I understand. And I agree with you. I'd like to have better, and I'll show some work we're doing in a minute that is a much better way of doing it. But f to get the masses of responses, we've done this. So... The other point I wanted to quickly make is we think that things are a bit biased because we would expect these two bars, which is the percentage of people who responded, or the number of people who responded, who had underground and overhead to be about the same. But what we think has happened is that the people who have underground feeds and don't see a problem haven't bothered to fill in the survey. Because we would expect the difference between the red and the blue to be much bigger. I've asked BT, we know it's about 50%, oh, it? okay, so but we haven't got the answer from BT, so it might be 40, so it might be 60. They yeah. should be about equal. It isn't that. So that was at one particular transition. That was, well, sorry, at two transitions. It was at either end of the downstream band. So I've plotted them all on top of each other. I know that they're at different frequencies, but the step size. I can then, so that's that graph shown small. We then did the same thing for downstream 2, and you notice that there are a few less with my definition of no impact, and I agree that there might be one, but that's a, a starting point. Um, we've got those at downstream 2, but if you look at upstream, you suddenly find that there's a load more people affected, particularly over here, where at upstream 2, which is between eight and a half and 12 megs, um, you actually have 53% of the people are seeing a detectable step change of more than 6 dB, because that's what I'm actually measuring. I'm then inferring that a detectable step change of more than 6 dB is a significant impact on their reception. So that's the worst case, more than 50% impacted. D3, just to complete the picture, and then some summaries on this part of the survey. So my conclusions are, from the survey we've done so far, is more people suffer upstream than downstream. 
which we know is the case anyway. The reason for that, by the way, is that everybody is close to theirs and their neighbor's modem, which is running flat chat, whereas not everybody is as close to the cabinet in the street. So the downstream is less power. As you get very close to the cabinet, you actually see the downstream goes up because you've got more signals to add up. So what I've then done is plotted for upstream 2, the RFI, 53% was more than 6 dB and 27% was more than 12 dB. And I put the same results for upstream 1. These are in decreasing annoyance, if you like, or the, the worst is at the top. Upstream 1 is next, then downstream 3, 2 and 1. And what we have seen by further analysis, you can't tell this from the graphs, is that the RFI levels are 5 to 10 dB lower for underground feeds than they are for overhead feeds. And this corresponds to the fact that we believe a lot of the underground feed, A, they tend to be in places where you've got very dense housing, and B, there is still the extension wiring inside the house, which is radiating. So the denser the housing, the more signals, the more noise, the better the antennas in the house or in the street, the more noise. So the conclusion from that part of the survey is that looking at the different bands, which is why 55 is greater than 53, because some people have problems in one band and not in others. But we think about 55% of the reports show reception, I believe, is impacted by VDSL. 25% actually have more than 12 dB of step in VDSL levels, which means that when it's stepped up, you are masking 12 dB of the available signals as an amateur. No, I'm not, because the 25 is included in the 55. Right. I'm saying 55 of the respondents have significant impact from VDSL. 25, sorry, serious impact. 55, detectable impact. But I agree with our friend here that we, there are other ways of doing it, but not with the masses of the RSE via Survey Monkey. But I'll come on to that. The other thing we looked at was how many people are actually seeing carriers and in which band their carriers after they transmit. So we found that about 15, 85% of the people saw none and these numbers are in the 5 to 10% range for the different bands and obviously some people see carriers on more than one band. So 13% see 4 kilohertz retraining carriers after transmitting and these actually cause an increase in your noise and also in the bit error rate of your or your neighbour's VDSL signal. And in fact, there are some people who are so good at it, not looking at anyone in particular, that they can completely obliterate their neighbour's VDSL. You need to have a chat with that person. Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, no. How do you do it? There is no universal answer to that. There are some that never come back on again. I have, my, I have my theory. Well, they're actually causing maximum noise all the time while they're off. Yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> my theory is that it's grandma over the street who actually turns her router off every time she goes to bed. Yes. And then the thing says, train me, train me, train me until the morning when she comes back and turns it on again. Then it says, you've got a really lousy line because I can't receive you most of the time, so I'm going to run at maximum power. So when the carriers go away, your noise is running at maximum power. That's what I believe. So if your person across the road turns theirs off, please ask them to leave it turned on because it will train down to the minimum level it needs to get through. If you keep turning it off, it will keep stepping it up and it will step down proportionately their speed. So you can sell it to them that if they leave it on, their speed will improve and it will. Correct. 11% of the electrics are all wasted in wall walks. Agreed. 
you know, this sort of thing. The other thing we did, and Martin, who's in the audience here, another member of the EMC committee, he's been writing some software which will actually analyze much more exactly how much power there is from VDSL there. And we use this as a source of samples. So we ask people to record WAV files and send them to us, and we put them through the, uh, the program. I'll try and show you the program running at the end, but... Uh, now I've got the projector running, I'm not going to stop until I've finished, and I'll come back to it. So this is what the output looks like. And in simple terms, what we're doing is we're looking for features of the VDSL signal that we can measure and identify as the VDSL signal. Because there is a lack of synchronism or accuracy between the clock of the SDR that took the readings and the clock of the VDSL system, the first thing that he has to do is to run through and synchronize it. And he does this by calculating the autocorrelation function, approximately. If I had the peak is the correlation. Yep. The number of PPM of error um, between the two clocks. And then, then having done that, he can then go through and measure and, ex and see which signals are VDSL that have the characteristics of the VDSL at the frequency of the, at the time synchronism of the VDSL. And then he can measure the total power. So on this graph, the result of the synchronization is these two big peaks here. Having done it, he then measures how much of this is VDSL. And interestingly enough, there's two peaks. I wonder what that could mean. Perhaps it's not only the nearest VDSL, but also the next nearest VDSL that we're detecting. He then measures the power in all of the signals in the bandwidth. So does that mean those are, more than four, those are four kilohertz power? No, they're just time synchronous. It's, it's, it's in the autocorrelation okay, domain. Shall I yeah, please. Do you want to grab a mic? Right, hello. Martin Satch, Kilo Delta Foxtrot. What this, this curve here is showing the, uh, the uh, as, as we vary the frequency and try and tune in and find the VDSL2 signal, uh, this is plus or minus 250 parts per million. So it finds the peak and, and it's found as minus nine parts per million. So the SDR, probably the SDR is out by um, nine parts per million. Um, because the VDSL2 is locked nationally, so it's probably atomic accurate. Um, so it is a reference you could use if you've got this software. <coughs> um, then what it does is it finds um, the, the symbols. The, the symbol rate is 4,000 a second. So what it does, it has to align up with the symbols. Um, so once it's found the correct symbol rate, it then finds the point in the, at which the symbols are aligned. So, so you, you imagine like a stroboscope, so it's, it's 4,000 times a second, and so this is showing, showing the alignment. So here, um, this is actually the gap between symbols. Um, do you want me to go on a bit, John? No, I think that, that, yeah. that'll oh, do for oh, now. Oh. But the, the important thing, and please talk to Martin about it afterwards if you want more details, but I suspect we'll lose some of us, including me. Um, no, it's not fair. Uh, the important thing here is these tiny numbers at the bottom, which says that the VDSL power is only half a dB less than all of the other signals for this particular, in this particular <coughs> recording. So wants to try and run their receivers half a dB above very loud white noise. So that's why that number is important. Okay? As you, in fact, get other results, and this one is for minus 6.8 dB, you might be able to detect it quite well at 6.8 dB above noise, depending on how good your ear is. Or as you go up to 15 dB in this example, you can see how things become less definite, but we are still able to measure the power. And I think that perhaps answers the earlier question. So 
What we've got to do now is obviously we got, I think, about 40 recordings. Many of them we can't analyse at the moment, but we do have 40 sets of data to turn the programme. Once we get the programme working, then hopefully um, we will be able to make it available for people to put their own data through. At the moment, if we did it, we'd spend all the time on the phone um, acting as a user manual, so we're asking you to send it in and do it. But there's another confirmation of the, the problem. John, a really stupid question. If there, were horizontal, if there were labels on the horizontal and vertical axes of these graphs, what would they actually say? Because I've no idea what that's a graph of. It's a graph of amplitude on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal. Time shift. So we have a method by which we can now measure it. What you might like to think about is if we can extract and measure the noise of VDSL, can we extract and throw away the VDSL? And that's something which we are starting to work on now. So the EMC committee, Martin in particular, is looking at whether there are ways that we can A, refine this as an estimate of the power but then try and extract that power. Um, but I must get on, or I'll take too long. So, downstream, our conclusions are that downstream is the strongest... Sorry, I've got something up on my screen. Downstream is the strongest near to the cabinet, because it's the sum of many. Upstream is the strongest furthest from the cabinet, and the reason for that is that as you get further away from the cabinet, the modems actually use more power to get back to the cabinet. Um, overhead drop-wise act as resonant antennas. In-house extension wiring also acts as resonant antennas. And it's worst, and this is the one real no-no, if your antenna, like mine here, is in the near field of the noise source, then you'll get a lot of noise. So make sure you're not in the near field. And more than 50% of the survey responses are suffering from degraded signals. Okay, I'm going to. I've got another 15, haven't I? Okay. So the other thing we decided to do was to look at some drive-by measurements. And this isn't very clear, but basically that's my car with this loop on the roof and with this box inside driving a PC, and those who were in at the beginning saw the program actually running, whereby it steps through all of the VDSL survey or any other frequencies you want to look for. Um, it does five a second, and you just drive along, and it records it. If you then import, so you get one CSV value file per sample, and they're organized by frequency. So we are taking... 11.9, 12, 12.1 megahertz, very close together in time, and we're plotting them. If we then import that into Excel and use the heat map feature, whereby blue is 8.68 dB microvolts per meter, don't go asleep or less, blue's okay. Will that do? Green is a bit of a nuisance. And unfortunately, the projectors, I think this projector certainly lost red, but red up on the far right is a bloody nuisance, if you'll excuse my French. So here, this is all red, even though it looks like a muddy brown. This is blue, and in between here is green. There are two cabinets, one here, two FTTC, FTTC cabinets, one there, and one here somewhere. 
but this is at, um, it doesn't say what that does, it's 3.85 megahertz, and the interference close to the cabinet is not too bad at that frequency. It's the higher frequencies it gets worse. So then if we go out to a bigger area, I don't know, is that coming up any better on that screen? Have you got any reds? And, yeah. No? Yeah. Orangey green. So that's a much wider area. And what I'm going to do next, says he, hoping it works, is we've actually put that together in a, a, a slide, in a video, which will, if it runs, which will not run. I'll have to try and show you that at the end, sorry. Um, I had, it runs fine on some projectors and not on others, but basically what it does is it plots all of those graphs at different frequencies and I'll run it as a separate program at the end. It just won't run from embedded within PowerPoint, and it shows you how it changes. But what I can go on to show you is what the individual readings look like. So let me explain first. This piece down the bottom here is a 30 megahertz spectrogram, of which I plonked a meter on top of it because we're only interested up to 18 or 20 megahertz. This bit here is expanded in that window. Then we put a receiver there. Look at this window on the top right. And we measure the power in 9 kilohertz bandwidth, because that's the standard way of doing it. And we record it, in this case, at 49.3 dB microvolts per meter. We record that to the log file. So what do we, the main thing to look at is this graph at the bottom. Important thing is I'm averaging over one or two seconds. If I don't put averaging in my SDR at one to two seconds, I will just see white noise. I won't be able to see the underlying DC band levels. So this is downstream one. This is upstream one. This is downstream two. This is upstream two. And this is downstream three. And this down here where my cursor is, is where the noise floor would be if I wasn't sat next to a VDSL cabinet. So at this particular case, which was one of the ones on the map, I'll show you it in a moment, um, we are getting 49 dB microvolts per meter. Now bearing... Is that, that top right hand bit of the spectrum there, is it, that's with VD, effectively with VDSL turned off, is it? No, that's VDSL noise. It, it, it will be round about minus 100 dB milliwatts, which is um, around about 10 dB microvolts per meter. I'm sorry about all the units, but that's the way EMC people work. Um, so if it's less than 10 on this meter, it's OK. It probably won't cause you any problems. The background noise in a quiet environment would be zero. 10 is OK. 50 is a bit of a nuisance, really. So what happens if you put 10 dBs of noise onto your signal? What happens if you put 20 dB on? If you put 10 dB on, you lose about 90% of the signals. Put 20 dB on, probably can't hear anything. So what I'm going to do now is just run through some other ones. And I want you, says he, To just look mainly at this bottom graph here. Sorry, this is still the same one with me telling you what I've just said. This is another case. You can see different bands predominate. This one, um, the upstreams are low and the downstreams are high. So the upstreams there and there are low and downstream one, two and three are visible. What do we think is happening here? Notice those spikes? Training. Training carriers on all the time. Grandma's turned her modem off, probably. Um, but again, you see the level. This one's 30 dB. And this is at the lower step point. 
So it's probably going up to 40 so GB. Does that mean training carriers only come, come from the, the network and not from the modem? Training carriers only come from, um, they are initiated by the network and answered by the modem, as far as I know. Am I right or wrong, Martin? Um, well, it'd have to go both ways depending yeah. on which band you're checking. That's true. He's right. It depends on the band. We're also very lucky because the man I keep referring to actually wrote a lot of the firmware that runs in these things. <laughs> he knows it inside out and I don't. <laughs> but he's, as you can see, he's a, very, he's a very useful asset to the society. So I just... <laughs> I, I just... Yeah. Yep. A lovely explanation, but in real terms, I'm trying to comprehend how the average amateur, if there is such a thing, with a halfway dipole on 80 metres at 30 or 40 feet, is going to hear VDSL noise, presumably a lot greater than what you're actually showing using the roof. Uh, am I wrong? The... It's, sim it's simplistic, but what we actually found during the first part of my talk yeah. was I actually presented what you guys found. Yeah, yeah but I mean, in real time operational amateur radio, you've got people with dipole, people with vertical, yep. people with beams up. Because I've never heard it sound when it's been turned off, that's why. It will sound like a dead band. Hmm. That's it won't sound like a dead band because your, meet, your S meter will be either halfway up. Correct, but it will sound yeah. like a dead band. So it's, what, what I want to keep doing is just try and finish and then I'll take some questions at the end. But, so if we go back to, we didn't see the video, but you can see the, some of the outcomes here. People asked me where the cabinets were. Um, this is, there are, there's a, a voice cabinet there and a VDSL cabinet there. This is at 3.65 megs. D1 is stronger, closer to the cabinet, and where there are dense tan houses, you actually see where there are lots and lots of VDSL signals, you get stronger levels. Um, upstream is stronger, furthest from the cabinet, and what I've tried to draw on here rather badly is the path the wires take. All right, and you see all the red rounds here. And in the guard band, you can see it's largely green. Except there is one example at 12 megahertz, whereby part of the whole route was just solid red because I was picking up some signals like you were talking about. Correct, and all the wiring in the, and everybody does that. Do you get any problem from um, the cables that are running from manhole to manhole? Yes, you do, but not as much. So, we were using a fairly complicated piece of kit here, but Martin, G8, J, and J, not that Martin, another Martin, um, has also made a very simple system based on a dongle, and I think that, that this explains if the video will now work uh, quite well. No, it won't work. So I'm going to be brave and pop out of this and try and run the video. So what you've got here at the top is a spectrogram. At the bottom is the spectrum analyzer. Over here is a map with your position shown on it. And that's what you can actually see. The audio level is a measure of the noise. Oh, there goes a telegraph pole. Now this is an artificial level that the pitch changes with the actual level. It's not what you can hear. So every time you pass a telegraph pole, 
it goes up and down. What practical use is that? If you actually use it in your garden, then you can find the point of minimum VDSL signal and you can put your antenna there to minimise the impact. So having shown you the results, what I'm going to do now is show you a few things you can do about it. OK, so in simple terms, and this presentation will be going up on the website, so you'll be able to look at it in, in more time. But get the antenna out of the near field of the telephone drop wire. Find the best place to put it. Best device I can give anybody. Try a loop receive antenna, if that isn't good enough. You can put that in more places, but please don't put your active loop right next to your transmitter, because it might not work for very long. Um, but, you know, I use this in my garden. I put it in a certain position and it nulls out most of the VDSL problems I have. You can do, yes. I don't because I actually want to leave it nulled on the biggest source of, okay, so of VDSL. Are the sources always the same for the set different bands? Um, they must move around for different areas. For different they do. Okay. But I only really have a problem on U2 right. and U1. So... Um, it's the same neighbour. Uh, you can try a current transformer. If you put a current transformer, which um, is a little clamp, and if you stick it around your telephone wire, does he not being able to find it? Anyway, it's a clip-on ferrite. I've got one I'll show you at the end. Uh, ten turns on it then you can feed that into one side of a phase canceller. We, have a, we show you how to do this in RADCOM. Um, and the other side of the phase canceller you can put in your real signal and you can then subtract your sample of the VDSL signal from the real signal using analog. Gives about 5 dB of improvement, 10 dB if you're lucky. You can use a remote receiver. Somebody who I suspect is here, John, is actually set up a whole second receiver somewhere where it's quiet, a bit extreme, or you can operate between the carriers. What SOTA have done for their CW operation is they only transmit at frequencies between the carriers. Not that they have problems up on the mountains, but the guys who respond, if they happen to trigger the carriers, then the guy up the mountain ain't going to hear their response. So if you can actually operate at frequencies between the carriers, you're less likely to hit the carriers. And what's even more important, of course, is if the carriers are running, when the SOTA guy talks back, the person who is listening to his response is now listening through noise, and if the noise is higher than the signal, he won't hear anything. And this is why I think VDSL people have got away with it for so long, because what happens when you have VDSL, you don't hear anything. Can you reduce it by doing things to your phone connection? Yes, you can. Um, you can use one of these boxes, which is an NTE 5C Mark IV faceplate rather than the separate dongles. You can disconnect unused extensions, and if possible, all extensions. They're not antennas anymore. You can contact us at the EMCC, and we can ask OpenReach to go and do a line balance for you on all of the lines on your DP. You can ring them up and complain about your service and they'll fix your lines, but they won't touch your neighbours. Um, the RSGB has got an agreement with OpenReach that they'll go and check all the lines on a DP and give them the best balance possible. You can put a common mode filter on your connection to the modem. Sounds a bit posh, doesn't it? There's a common mode filter. Bit of wire through a couple of ferrites gives about 30 dB of attenuation. Or you can add a notch filter. And there are two types of notch filter. Martin has designed some, uh, some LC filters. There's one. It's built into an RJ11 doubler. So you plug that in. 
gives you a notch. At, this one's at 80 metres. He's made them at 160 metres. What that then does is when you... And I'll show you this quickly before I finish. When your system trains up, it doesn't use that frequency. If you don't want to make an LC filter, pass it round, and it actually needs to be used like that, what do you think that is? Mm -hmm. What do you think it does? It's a stub. It's an open-ended stub, quarter of a wavelength long, made out of an extension cable for a telephone. And the only trick is that to make it half as long, I've taken it up the middle two pair and then folded it back up the upper two pair. And that actually has an interesting effect because that particular stub filter will give attenuation at about 3.5 megahertz and about 7 megahertz. Gives the second harmonic as well as the odd harmonics. Only on your phone. Only on your phone. About 0.62. But you measure it, I mean. Yeah. Yep. So, correct. But you might be, if you've got good neighbours, you might be able to do that. So we haven't found a universal fix. What this actually does, the top graph is without the filter. The bottom graph is with the filter. And, you can, and what it is a graph of are the tones that are being used inside the modem. So you can see it stops the tones being used where the notch is. And you can do the same thing by transmitting, can't you, Steve? And you can actually measure the impact you can have if you can get inside the per person's modem. That's the open circuit stub. You can actually measure its impact, because what we've done here is we've looked at the noise when we've fitted one of these stubs, and hey presto, the noise goes down. So you don't have to get inside your modem to measure the impact. You can actually measure the noise when you plug that thing in. So it doesn't use frequencies near the quarter wave stub. There's the notch. If you want to collect evidence, you need to do one of these things. This was a simple test that was done by GM0DEQ, whereby he used Whisper. He set up two whisper stations, one at his house and one in a quiet area. And he found in the quiet area he could receive the ones on the left, whereas near his house he could only receive the ones on the right. That's a clear evidence of all the signals absent from the USA. This is what we want OpenReach to do. But John, does that count as evidence to Ofcom that you are being affected? It counts as evidence, but whether they take any notice of it or not, we're trying to find out. So basically improve the line balance, get rid of the self-installs, remove the upstream bands because it doesn't take away much bandwidth, notch the amateur bands, reroute the cables, or use FTTP. They're the only things we think that OpenReach can do to fix it. And I'll stop there. I was going to go on to talk about other things, but I've taken up all my time. I think that's correct. We're five minutes over time. I guess we've got time. Ooh. I guess we might have time for one question. If anyone has a burning issue that they want to raise with John, otherwise... Otherwise, I'll be around. <laughs> Reading in red, Tom, Tom's washed its hands completely of um, solar cell noise. This is intolerable. They've, somehow, they've got to be made to be responsible for that. But what's the... Well, we actually, we have been following wind farm, solar cell, and VDSL. We decided to make, put, concentrate our efforts on VDSL because it was affecting more amateurs than anything else. What we're going to try and do is to persuade them on this case to do something about it. Then we'll go and collect similar evidence for solar PV. The inverters, the switch mode power supplies are all still causing us problems. There is some international coordination. The, the even bigger problem, which I was going to talk about on the extra slides, was um, wireless power transfer. Buses are going to be charged with wireless power transfer stations, 85 kilohertz, kilowatts of power. 
and that's going to cause us horrendous problems. Okay. Currently, wind farms do. On that happy note, I think we'll have to leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps you'd be kind enough to show your appreciation for an excellent presentation. Thank you.